Okay. All right, good. We're off. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're well into the fall here. And we've got Thanksgiving next week, so I think we've got a little bit lower attendance than usual, but we are recording, so folks can view later as needed. Um, we have our student presentations um, today for students from the uh, general um, region. Um, as I mentioned, the meeting is being recorded. Um, all of these recordings are located <clears throat> at this resources webpage. Meetings take place every third Thursday of the month, 2.30 to 3.30. However, today we're going to go, um, likely we're going to go a little bit later so that um, the four um, students have enough time to get through their 10 minute or so presentations. Uh, Zoom link is the same every time. Keep that for your records if you like. I send out reminders to our um, network um, a, a week prior to these meetings and then day of, morning of. So if, um, if you'd like uh, any uh, people you know to be on that list, let me know. Happy to add them. Um, Delaware River Watershed Initiative folks are attending, other DRB, other Delaware River Basin folks. We do have folks from outside the DRB that attend. These meetings, um, we're supporting the meetings via the Delaware River Watershed Initiative um, by William Penn Foundation, as well as Seesaw. Um, this is the website for the DRWI. Um, Consortium for Scientific Assistance to Watersheds is Seesaw. It's a PADEP um, funded project. Um, <clears throat> These meetings are simply a time to, to present information, to review uh, issues, ask questions, so on and so forth. We provide updates and generally a presentation. Um, Stroud team presently is me, Shannon and Krista. Krista is uh, with the Muskinet Kong Watershed Association, but also a Stroud technician. Um, Carol and George and other water, master watershed stewards, Joe Debus, for instance, um, playing a, a pretty major role in facilitating things within the network. Um, John, Matt, and Dave are the DRWI leads from the Stroud Center. Um, <clears throat> as far as the Enviro DIY in the Delaware River Basin, um, Stroud Center is uh, trying to support uh, groups and using the stations for their own internal purposes, as well as secondarily um, analyzing data, developing tools, and providing guidance on um, data, technical issues with the stations, um, applying the data in local contexts, etc. So I'm just going to go into a few updates from the Stroud Center. Um, we're still in the fall. Battery, battery powers may uh, still be an issue when there's less light, but still leaves on the trees. Um, once the leaves fall, then um, there'll be better exposure from the sun. So that should resolve most battery issues. Um, in the meantime, you can cycle batteries. Certainly feel free to be in touch with Stroud, uh, Shannon and me, if you're having power issues and you wanna um, just advice or assistance, feel free to be in touch. With the leaves in the water, obviously turbidity sensors may foul more, so just be aware of that. Um, snapshots, salt snapshots in particular, can be done all year long. So if you'd like to, um, you know, there's seem to be groups doing those on a regular basis. Um, if you'd like to uh, do that, if you'd like support on that, please feel free to be in touch. Um, also, if you have ongoing stories, you know, success stories or learning experiences, whatever that you'd like to share um, and amplify uh, via Stroud Center social media, feel free to be in touch. You can message Diane um, and or me. Um, <clears throat> just a review of these forms. 
Uh, we do have a service request form that you can use if you're having station issues and you want to request service from um, troubleshooting assistance or whatever from Shannon, feel free to use that on this resources page. Um, a reminder to fill out field visit data forms um, if possible when you're out visiting a stream. You can fill out the hard form and then enter it into this online Google form. Um, we do recommend filling those forms out anytime you're at a station just for record keeping. Um, you can access that data. Um, once it's in there, it's publicly available and you can access it um, via this web page. There's a lot of other guidance materials there as well. Um, just as a um, reminder about next month's presentation, our next month's meeting, I should say, um, it's going to be December 14th, as opposed, this is the second Thursday of the month. Um, <clears throat> just doing that to accommodate for um, the holiday and such. Uh, I don't know. I was going to plan, I was going to do an end of year summary, um, but I think there's an opportunity to also do some other stuff if we want during that time, maybe a few updates from teams, maybe a kind of year in review, tech year in review from Shannon, if she's interested. Um, any other suggestions, please be in touch if you have any kind of ideas about what might be useful information to present in that uh, next meeting, in that meeting next month. Okay. Local policy and practice work group continues to work on stuff. This is the current group. Um, we're meeting first Thursdays of the month, 11 to 1230. Um, this is our short term charge, basically just figuring out ways to um, use the stream, the Enviro DIY sensor station, monitoring station data in the local context, um, informing, influencing municipal decision making, so on and so forth. Um, the temperature guidance document. Um, comprehensive document is uh, in its last stages. We're developing multiple one pagers that are for public distribution, distribution and meetings for non-science audiences. Um, the document, so-called document five, municipal engagement, a broader document to talk about overall municipal government, how it functions, how to be effective working with local government, um, this type of thing. That document is completed. And we're going to be, uh, be, we've already begun working on the conductivity guidance document and one pagers. Um, <clears throat> this is just some more information about the temperature, um, temperature work. I'd say basically just if you're interested in this, um, in these documents, in this work, please just be in touch. And we'll um, we can start a dialogue, try to support you in um, getting one pagers or whatever you may need um, for use in your local context. Um, I think someone needs to mute. Um, if one of our co-hosts could check who maybe needs to mute, there we're getting some feedback from somewhere. Um, So uh, again, document five also just, you know, I think basically just be in touch. We're going to be putting these documents all on the resources page here at some point. We'll update folks when that happens. But until then, just be in touch if you're interested in receiving any of these documents. Okay. Um, any questions before we move on? Good. Sorry, I hit your mute button by mistake, David. Um, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Just I wonder. No, no worries. <laughs> I wonder. Um, I wanted to ask: do, do people? You've asked for some input on different things. Do people know that they have your email and know that they can contact you? Is this how you want them to put those suggestions in? Yeah, I mean, I guess you can you can email me. I mean, we don't have uh, Dave Manning. Um, or your, I mean, I guess I did have those emails listed, but you can certainly contact me and I can put folks in touch with 
the other local policy work group members. Um, well, the, the ideas for December, things like, and other meetings, things like that. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, just just be in touch with me if you have ideas for for December, uh, or other meetings, of course. Um, and yeah, Bert here said available for consultation. Yeah, I mean, certainly, folks, feel free to be in touch with with me and Shannon. Um, and there's plenty of other folks like Carol and Joe and George and others who um, you know are are you know available to kind of provide feedback, provide guidance um, on a number of different issues, depending on you know what the issues are. Okay, um, so I am just going to um, review the folks we have here to present who are going to be presenting. So we've got Jay Bird, Elizabeth Rushman, Saranya Anantapantala, and Toby Brown. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit about each of them here so they don't have to spend too much time introducing themselves. Um, Elizabeth is a sophomore at Princeton. She's majoring in economics with a constant with concentrations in data science and environmental science. She's interested in sustainability, uh, sustainability startup or sustainable finance after college. She volunteers at the at Princeton's garden and is involved with a venture capital club that invests in sustainable startups. Elizabeth also worked with the Stroud Center in doing monitoring work in Westchester area. Um, longitudinal monitoring of salt contamination, and she did some, came up with some really nice results, wrote it up in a report, and has done presentations on that, um, on that work she did at conferences and such. Um, Jay is a, a fellow at the, for the Alliance for Watershed Education, uh, John Hines Wildlife, National Wildlife Refuge. He's also an intern there. Um, he's at Delaware County Community College. Uh, likely to move on to a four-year university soon in biology, wants to be uh, an environmental educator. Lots of those at the Stroud Center, Jay, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, he's leading a number of different events, um, you know, in support of environmental awareness and uh, education in the Delaware Basin. Uh, Toby uh, is a student at, at in Allentown, um, he is doing some um, independent monitoring work for Saucon Creek Watershed Association and contributing that to the Lehigh Valley Watershed Coalition. I'll let Toby feel free to chime in at your presentation if you want to say any more about your background and such. And then Saranya um, <clears throat> is also a high school student. She's very active with a blog. Um, founder of a number of different organizations and uh, interviewing uh, women in science, and also even put out a book recently. So um, I will stop share now and pass it off to Elizabeth if you want to share your screen and take it away for your presentation. We've got about 10 minutes for each student. Okay, awesome. Thank you, David. Um... All right. Can everyone see that? All right. <laughs> yeah. Good to go, Elizabeth. Perfect. Um, thank you again, David, for the introduction and to Carol for organizing um, this presentation. Um, so basically, my research under the Stroud Center was targeted longitudinal monitoring of a watershed in Westchester to kind of understand the situation of conductivity and freshwater salinization. Um, and this was supported Hold on, let me see if this, there we go. Um, so basically, to give a little prior um, background, I shadowed Patty Haug, who is a Penn State Master Watershed Steward, um, for about three months at the EnvioJOI Continuous Monitoring Site um, in Westchester. And I worked with the Stroud Center to develop my abilities to conduct research and kind of follow proper experimentation protocol. And David was kind enough to help me with the template of the research project, which was super nice. And as David also mentioned, I'm now a sophomore studying economic data science and environmental studies. 
So background for the study, um, Patty Haug did her master's in um, on five streams in Westchester to map certain conductivities and kind of measure them. And so um, referring to the EnviroDOY um, monitoring station in one of her streams, the Gordon Natural Area to be specific, um, it was showing really um, high levels of conductivity, so 620 microsiemens per centimeter, which is significantly higher than what the um, geographical prediction was for the conductivity of the stream, which was supposed to be around 80, which is according to Olson and Cormier. So obviously there was some red flags starting the, the study. And so this is just a visual of um, the EnviroDRI station and the location on the map of where that is in terms of reference to Westchester and the city. Um, here is the mapped out watershed according to EnviroDRY or to the uh, monitor my watershed and just a closer look up to um, the sensor. Um, so I basically just assigned various stations using a GPS on my phone to map specific coordinates for locations along the stream. And I kind of gave them some um, labels based on like where they were or um, where they were situated. Um, so here's kind of the watershed mapped out. Um, and so basically the headwater was um, at a church um, in the more urban part of Westchester, as we'll see later. And um, the end is kind of running through the Gordon Natural area. So basically, I wanted to measure the chloride and conductivity levels. Um, and I wanted to measure this when the um, EnviroDIY station was at a base flow, which meant there were no storm conditions or kind of wonky um, baseline data sets. And so I kind of wanted to see what the data looked like in relation to the watershed landscape. Um, the materials I used were the um, Hotch Quantive Tritraders um, to measure the um, chloride, and then the Hanna Disk 3 to calculate the conductivity. And so this is just kind of a visual of the timeline that I followed. Um, because um, on June 15th and 20th, the rainwater or the baseline conditions were disrupted, I decided not to measure conductivity and chloride on these days, but for the remainder of the times, they fit within the base flow conditions, which is 650 microsiemens per centimeter plus or minus 50, which is kind of an arbitrary metric, but just to ensure it was kind of standardized. Um, so the results, um, kind of what we would have expected, um, conductivity and chloride, actually, no, this is kind of counter to what um, nature kind of entails. Um, the conductivity in chloride decreased from upstream to downstream, which is usually the opposite trend in a natural situation. Um, urbanization was directly correlated with freshwater salinization, and it was kind of occurring at a really alarming rate in comparison to previous studies. So here's just a visual of the um, the graph or the um, the concentration levels that we were seeing, which were very staggeringly high, especially in consideration of what the natural predicted level was, which was 80. These are like upwards of 10 times the amount that it was predicted to be. So that's just really crazy um, to imagine. And so here's another kind of graph overlaying um, what I was seeing when I was measuring. Um, it basically just shows um, the conductivity over the set of days with the kind of data spread out a little bit based on each station along the stream. And you can kind of see the trend line of increasing at the headwaters to decreasing as you go further downstream. And so according to some metrics, um, the chloride um, concentration um, was the health concerns with chloride concentration was um, broken in several instances. None of them were ideal chloride concentrations, um, but based on these criteria below, you can kind of see where along the stream um, these data points were kind of broken. 
which is an alarming concentration, um, especially at, towards the headwaters. Um, chloride giving the same kind of breakdown. Um, you can kind of see where the um, thresholds are and that um, station one consistent and two consistently broke that threshold for um, certain chloride levels. So definitely um, a very concerning result. And here are the graphs of urbanization and connectivity, which kind of break down how um, more urban land use, uh, increased concrete, um, increased de-icers in the winter can kind of affect the concentration of a body of water. And especially when all of those salts can get concentrated in one area and kind of in a body of water and distributed downstream. And R squared was fairly significant in each of these cases showing a strong positive correlation between them. And so referencing a previous study, um, there is some, uh, uh, in De Frederico 2005, he had some um, testing areas which kind of matched up alongside mine. They weren't exact locations, but they're approximately um, the same along the map. And so you can just see in my station one, um, Amir, like 15 years later, there was a 116% increase in concentration, which is a little bit concerning because um, it's been such a short time period and we're basically just seeing a doubling of the concentration of a stream. Um, and who knows how that's affecting the biota there and um, kind of what that trend is going to become later um, as we still use de-icers and increased urbanized or in increasing the urbanization of Westchester. So basically, as a result, um, it can be concluded that the tributary in the Gordon Natural Area seems to be significantly influenced by urbanization um, outside the preserved forested area. Um, so just kind of, again, reinforcing the fact that it started at the headwater much more polluted and it's actually diluting as it goes downstream. So for further research, um, more metrics can be evaluated at the stream, such as pH hardness and sulfate levels. In addition, um, certain cations are known to be more harmful to stream biota. So like having testing for calcium, magnesium, and sodium could kind of also um, determine certain damages to the stream. Um, in addition, when um, salts are kind of funneled through water, they they land in soil. So it would be interesting to see like how much de-icers have become um, present in soil. Um, so that is also an area of study that we can look at. Um, so for next steps to kind of resolve this issue, um, just could be ways to reduce our contribution to, um, uh, the road salt and the amount of ions that are entering the stream. So maybe by using heated sidewalks or other means such as better snow plows, we can avoid using salts. Um, obviously this is an ideal solution. I like in a perfect world, we would want to remove salt from stream, but because of basic chemistry, that's kind of hard to do without um, an energy intensive process and which would also disrupt the life in the stream. So um, I'm hoping that in the future, maybe someone can develop that. But um, for right now, we still the best thing we can do is just reduce our impact. So I guess just to um, end where I am now, um, I'm involved in a lot of sustainability efforts um, on campus, and I've been involved in a bunch of super cool projects helping with um, water um, issues and uh, climate change related problems. Um, one such uh, startup is called Polygon. Um, I helped invest in that in my venture capital club. It's a type of um, mechanism that removes bioplast or it removes plastics from water to kind of help alleviate um like the forever chemicals and um like microplastics that are kind of 
um, winding up in drinking water. So that was a really cool project to be involved with. And additionally, I created a video with some friends for a project um, in an environmental science class on Princeton's new geothermal um, energy project, which is hoping to reduce carbon emissions by around 60% in the next couple of years. Um, so um, this video was actually featured on the sustainability website. And I was really fortunate to be able to research um, that um, project as well as other things going on campus. So I really look forward to increasing my involvement in sustainability and my relationship with water resources in the next couple of years. And thank you again, um, David, for the um, inviting me to this call and again for Carol for organizing. And if anyone has any questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Elizabeth. <clears throat> Really nice presentation. Um, some of that stuff you're doing now, school is um, interesting. Uh, how about we take questions right now um, so that it's fresh on people's minds? I have a question about the geothermal. It, have 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 they looked into? I mean, you mentioned heated sidewalks in your presentation. Have they looked into any of that on on campus? I think that's honestly something that could be incorporated in the future, but I, for right now, I'm pretty sure they just want to focus on the energy component. I don't think um, road salts has been presented as much as an, of an issue mm -hmm. for them. I assume maybe in coming years, it will be something they incorporate. It's a climate issue at the, from their perspective, I guess. Yeah. Elizabeth, I have a question about the, I think it was the polygon that's uh, takes up, I wasn't sure what it's pulling out of the water, macroplastics, microplastics, and how does it work, basically? Um, so basically, it's these tiny, um, like almost brushes that um, pick up microplastics from water. It's not supposed to be like large pieces of plastic, but I think it doesn't have to be um, really micro microplastics that they're picking up. Um, but the goal is to get those small pieces of plastic, essentially. And when it picks up the plastics, where does it put it? Does it need, does it need maintenance? You know, at certain time periods, to 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 take it out. Yeah. So the way that it works is that um, it gets caught in the fibers, um, and then I think they clean the um, brushes every now and then, and then they. I think the objective is to use the microplastics that it pulls out to um, to repurpose into like building materials. So it's basically going to get cleaned and then placed back into the body of water. Thank you. Um, let's see, Bert has a question uh, for Elizabeth. Elizabeth, did you share your data with any city, town, county, state agency? I have an answer to that, but you answer first. Um, I published it. I have a little like mini blog that I published it in. I don't think it got that many views, um, but I don't know if maybe on your end, David, if it was shared. I did present yeah. it at the Water Congress, which was really an awesome opportunity. Um, but besides that, I didn't formally present it to anyone. Yeah, that was the Watershed Congress 2022, right, Elizabeth? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so she presented it there. Um, but Bert, we we have um talked with Westchester and attended meetings. Um and uh John you Jackson, know, I've had this dialogue with you about like planning boards yeah so boards, we we've used we've actually legislators used, yeah we've actually used elizabeth's work in talking with with westchester like saying this is what we've noticed it's not positive what are we going to do about it well that we and, and it's an interesting question and that as you know that's why we formed this local policy and practice work group but yeah. um <laughs> we got we got very good response from westchester 
and that Excellent. and let the supervisors were mm. understood and were you know were amenable to you know the the idea yeah. <laughs> of 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 managing for it but you know i i think a problem we run into is that they're very busy with a lot of other things. It's uh, like, how do you, how do you get them to pay attention? Yeah. Because yeah. They I are think busy. that is still a question. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, the feedback we've been getting, and this is going down a rabbit hole potentially, but the feedback we've been getting in the work group from talking directly with supervisors is that the main thing, it seems to me, the main thing that they say is that, people need to show up regularly. Mm -hmm. Like you can't just show up to a meeting, give a presentation and then establish a, a, a relationship. Yeah. You have to establish a relationship. You have yep. to really kind of, you know, be a participant and a team player with the, you know, the supervisors. If you're an EAC being active and communicative and team playing, I mean, Steve Tricarico who's a leader of the work group, you know, he's been doing it for 20 years in his yeah. township and he's just very, you know, adamant about the fact that you have to be consistent. You have to show up, you have to be a team player, you know, um, all that stuff is very, um, um, regardless of how, yeah. you know, if it's not a lee, if it's not a legal precedent, then mm -hmm. at that point, then you have to be, you really have to work and cooperate and, plan for the long term and present valid reliable data about it's getting worse yeah in this yep. area so yeah i think yep. that has yep. a lot of value so and in your region you know in your yeah. region you're you're sort of you're not as nearly as contaminated as what elizabeth was showing yes in southeastern pa so you're yep. sort of you know you've got time we're to establishing kind of establishing a we're establishing a baseline yep. Yep. yeah yeah um, well, yeah uh, thank you so much uh, uh, David, along the lines of Bert, this is Grace. Um, uh, do you have a recording um, uh, of that presentation? No. So unfortunately, that we we do not. That was a, you know, that was a town a, a multi township meeting in Westchester. So there's no recording of that. John, I mean, the presentation John gave is, I, I, you know, I think we could potentially share that with you, Grace. I think that would be helpful because um, most all the meetings that Bert and myself and, and others attend either at the town board or the planning board, um, assuming we haven't forgotten the GoPro, we record it and um gotcha and and it's just for our our record it's 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 public record uh but you in terms of planning how to do these presentations uh being able to get the the feedback from those officials uh clearly constancy is uh you know showing up yeah and uh, letting them know who you are, which we clearly have done. And we mend fences along the way and also confront where needed. Um, but yeah, that's the name of the game. So yeah. it's a very long road. Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. Um, all right, we should probably move on here. Jay, you wanna go next? Sure. Okay, I will share screen bring up Jay's presentation. Um, at some point in mine, I want to share my screen too to show a map that I have up. Awesome. Perfect. Okay, let me bring over Jay's. Here we go. And presentation mode. Okay, go for it, Jay. All right. Hi, I'm Jay Bird. Uh, I'm an Alliance for Watershed Education Fellow working at John Hines National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, the Alliance, if you don't know, is a center, well, an organization that is comprised of 23 different centers that go along the river. And the goal is just to get education and appreciation for the Delaware River to spread amongst any age group just along the river in general. If you don't know what John Hines is, it's the largest remaining tidal marsh in, the, in Pennsylvania. 
and it's about a thousand acres long and it's just a good spot for just relaxing and just appreciating wildlife in general. You can go to the next slide. There we go. One of the things I did uh, during my internship was have these microscope tables where I would basically just grab a water sample like straight out of the uh, marsh from the refuge and I'll bring it over to the front where people are just entering. And I would let people get to use the microscopes to see all the little things that just live in the water. And we would have an identification sheet out and everyone would just look at the sheets and uh, try to ID what they see and just learn more about it. And then I would also educate them about the fact that all these little things are important. It means that the water is healthy. Uh, and a lot of people have never used expensive microscopes like this before. So it's a really good way to just spark interest and just let people do these things that they never thought they would be able to do when they're heading into the refuge. You can go next. I think you, they just sorry, get sorry, sorry, Jay. I'm having trouble <laughs> with my advancing here. That's there fine. We go. Is that good? Yeah, the PowerPoint kind of merged together, but it's fine. Uh, so another thing I did was I helped the biology team at the refuge with uh, kayak surveys and carp control. With the kayak surveys, we would go out on kayaks in the marsh during high tide, and we would have this app on a tablet, and we would look out and just see any invasive plants inside of like the square areas and just map them out so that we could remove them in the future. We ended up surveying the entire marsh area, so we have a map of all the invasive species that we saw uh, within the area. Another thing we did was invasive carp control, which as you can see in the bottom picture, uh, that's us taking down the net. There were these like massive nets that we put up inside of the water and we would bait it with corn and then carp would come in and we'd wait like a couple of weeks and then come back. And that's when we would lift the net up and then grab any carp out of there so that we could later euthanize them. Uh, there were, I don't, I'm not sure the exact number but it was over a hundred carp that we got from one of the events. You can go to the next one. Sorry. Uh, another one I did was assisting with cleanups at Cobbs Creek. So the Alliance, one of the, uh, one of the centers that the Alliance is allied with is the Cobbs Creek Environmental Center. So I allied with Cobbs Creek ambassadors to help them out with their cleanups that they had there. And we ended up getting many bags of trash. We also did things like weed the sidewalks to just make the area just prettier in general. We cleaned inside of the creek and I think we got about six bags and we cleaned directly in the creek. And the other cleanups were just along the street and along the parkway of Cobbs Creek. You can go next. Um, possibly the biggest thing I did was the storm drain marking program. So on July 28th, I led my own storm drain marking event where uh, I went down 86 in Lindbergh and I was with a group of nine volunteers and we put these little markers and you can see it in the bottom picture and it little markers that inform people that the water goes straight to the local, local waterway because a lot of people don't know that storm drains actually lead to the water that they drink or the water that's around them. And they end up using them as personal trash cans or just like not keeping them clean and everything. And a lot of people also don't know that it leads to flooding from like just stuff getting clogged in, whether it's leaves or trash. So during the walk, I would give facts about the watershed and how important it is to keep. I would make sure I try to keep the facts aimed at uh, like how it affects people because that gets people to just like uh, have more activity when they know that it directly affects them. And the first event that I did ended up leading, ended up serving as a demo for two more events that were organized by Carol Armstrong. And uh, those events, we just went, bound, went around the same area in Lindbergh. And in total, we marked about, I think, 81 drains. Can I share my screen too? There we go. Go ahead, Jay. Mm -hmm. 
One second. Okay. So this is the map provided by Partnership of Delaware Estuary. It shows all the drains that are marked. Uh, all the little smaller dots around this area are the ones that are marked. The bigger dots are the ones that are yet to be marked. So all these yellow ones are Delaware River drains. These actually go to the Darby Creek, but they didn't have any uh, Darby Creek markers. So we marked them with Delaware River markers instead. And then down here are Schuylkill River markers, the green ones. And we marked this entire section around Lindbergh, all the way up and down the street. And we hope to go down the rest of 86th Street and just mark these final drains around this area. Jay, could you just zoom out a little bit? Uh -huh. so you can see a little more broadly where you're at there. Yeah, this is right outside of the refuge. It's in Lindbergh Boulevard. Okay. This is the refuge right here. Cool. Uh, you can go Great. back to the presentation. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it, it was three events total, so it did take a lot of time, but we are making really good progress as well. That's great. Um, okay, thanks, Jay. Uh, questions for Jay? I have one. Um, Jay, how many how many volunteers do you think you've personally worked with at this point? For the storm drain marking? All of it. Uh, it's hundreds for sure of like wow. people. I've just like volunteered with or just educated with in general. That's great. Um, sorry, did someone speak up there? I'll just say that the hands-on um, intro for people who've never been on a microscope, uh, coming to look at things that, you know, it's taking place in real time, it's just so smart and it's such a good way to engage people. I just think that's, uh, and did the group that the people who were looking at the, 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 the brand new samples and perhaps identifying uh, the organisms, did they also participate in, in the, the, the grating, the drain? thing did it was there a continuity or separate groups or different ages or um no the drain groups were also just uh mainly visitors from the refuge but they weren't the same ones as the people with the microscope with the drain marking we uh use like facebook and instagram to get the information out there and then we also had like flyers around the refuge so people could join so did you have a sign up ahead of time uh, it wasn't a sign up, but you could email us to tell us about it. But it was mainly just like show up at the time that was show up. Okay. And can you just give me the demographics, the age range, and of can I just add something in there? So the the storm drain marking was sought um, input from the community. So several members from the community also participated because they know their community best. They know where the visibility areas are. So I would include okay. those people when you think about the demographics, Jay. Mm -hmm. Yes, most of the people were from the community as well, especially on uh, Carol's storm drain marking event. But I mean, she was wanting to know the age range, like how young, how old, you know. Um, it was mainly older on the other ones, but on my event, there were, uh, there were two children there and about like three people that were just a little older than me, like maybe like 30s. And then... Oh, and then also my sister, who was 17, was at the event as well. Yeah, and so really anyone of any a anyone who can walk down the street can help with those storm drain storm drain markings. Yes, and we like made sure we advertised that it was for all ages as well. 
Um, what kind of follow up when you have a group uh, do you do with with af after the storm drainage investigations? Um, what kind of follow up for uh, to build on that do you have? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. Like, how do we? If you let's say you have 20 people out there, uh, you're and you're moving around. Uh, is is it one off for them, or uh, do you do, do they sign up and and you say we'll be in touch? How do you keep in touch with them to to start building that kind of participation and for the next time or a slightly di or a different project? Um, it is mainly for mine. It was one off. It was like we told like we just put out the advertisements for the refuge and if they wanted to show up, they could. But after that, I gave all the information about it to EFNC so that they could hold their own and they communicate a lot through email and such. Okay, thanks. Great. Um, all right, we should probably move on to our next presenter. Um, Saranya, are you ready? Okay, uh, go ahead and share screen and go for it. Awesome. Are you able to see that clearly? Looks looks good. Awesome. Okay. So, um, hi, I'm Australia and Puntla. Um, and as David mentioned, um, I'm from I'm a senior at Springport Area High School, which is in Phoenixville. Um, and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about like citizen science research, engineering, and advocacy. Um, and also just I want to say like thank you to David and 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 Carol for for creating this event for all of us to like present what we're doing um, and just inform inform others of, of what, what we're interested in and our perspective. So thank you so much for, for organizing this event. Um, yeah, but I really just wanna like walk through a couple of the things I've been doing um, and, and show you like what I think, um, how, we, how I think we can take environmental science further. So a little bit about me, I've been a master watershed steward since, since um, 2020. And since 2021, I've been volunteering as a Stroud Water Research Center to monitor Pickering Creek. Um, and I do this, I, I do this with, with um, Carol. Uh, she, she helped me like learn about Pickering Creek and like really apply what I learned as a master watershed steward to, to an actual creek. And um, that, was, that was extremely uh, useful. So first I just wanna discuss the, whoop, I just wanna discuss like the science and engineering aspect. Um, a little bit of like personal background. So ever since I was young, I have lived near some sort of water system. Um, for the first 13 years of my life, I was living in, in Michigan. We were really close to Lake Erie. So, so there I saw these effects of algal blooms. Now, the, the reason algal blooms are so impactful to me is, is usually when I, when I went to the, when that, when I went to Lake Erie, I was always like, I was going first, I was swimming or I was, um, I was going in a boat um, with my family. Or, or just or just having like a picnic near near the near the lake and that was like the color I saw was this beautiful blue and then suddenly oh when when I went there on more like on vacation during the summer I would see this like drastic shift to this like dark green it's foamy it smells bad we're not allowed to swim in it um and that really got me interested in what is this change that's happening and um is there something we can do about it um I would say like what, what I, I learned a lot more about algal blooms, like seeing the, see, like, like um, on the warning signs that they were, they were posted around the lake um, with information about like, what are algal blooms and what could be some of their effects. Um, and actually uh, uh, the turning point for me to like um, research algal blooms was when my family moved to Pennsylvania in around 2019, we were visiting different areas. And I saw like in these, in the, in the local nature, like like Pennsylvania, like the Blue Marsh Lake and Marsh Creek, I saw the exact same like massive algal bloom spanning across um, across the lake. So and even now while, while we're doing Pickering, like like Carol mentions, we see we see these algal blooms and it and it's and it becomes it, it's difficult to identify them. And that's why I started researching them in around in in like 2019. So 
I learned about like their di- like like what do they cause? How are they caused? So excess nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus in the water, but primarily through both observations and research, I saw that their effects on like producing toxins in the water harmed our pets like dogs. Um, and even at Lake Erie, I would see the I would see like on shore loads of dead fish would wash ashore and have this like um, like green speckles on them from from the algae. So we see that the the algal blooms can cause um, a, de- uh, a, le- a suffocation of the fish in the water. And also, like, as I mentioned, I saw that they smelled bad. Um, and I learned more about like the science behind that, um, that some algae can produce these odor compounds that, that are not pleasant for sure. Um, so I kind of, I, I, um, after researching them like on my own, I wanted to take it a little further. So I was inspired to reach out to um, some researchers on algal blooms. Um, I focused on the Lake Erie area, and one person who like connected back to me was someone from Auburn University. So he was previously working in Lake Erie, and then he moved to to Auburn to just look at more fisheries, uh, more fishery settings. Um, and this kind of, and I, and when I was researching here, I wanted to look at like the broad aspects of algal blooms. Um, so it was 2020. It was during COVID. Um, and I started with a data project, even though I wanted to like be in the field and, and try some um, like like in pond stuff, but it was COVID, so I had to work with data. But actually I learned so much about algal blooms with a, with a meta-analysis. So um, essentially I was looking at different kinds of algal control treatments, bacterial, physical, chemical, and plant-based. Um, and, I, and I compared these treatments quantitatively using a meta-analysis which is like a comparison of different published um, studies and different experiments to see like um, what is the broad, um, like what is the setting of the field at the moment. And what I learned was that a lot of, I learned about some treatments that were effective, but what I learned is there's so many gaps in what, what, what kinds of treatments we've been doing. We've mostly been focusing on chemicals, really short lived treatments um, and not so much on like more sustainable long run, um, like plant based and, and eco friendly treatments. So I really wanted to focus focus on that. So actually, this whole journey, I'm, I'm really proud of I was able to um, work with my professor with my research advisor, and we published this meta analysis in the water research journal earlier this year. But leveraging the results from this meta analysis, um, I, I, I conducted a bunch of experiments to test new kinds of treatments, like combining treatments that would that were like um, effective, combining those treatments and seeing could they make even more effective um, reductions on algae and even trying biological controls such as using zooplankton um, in order to control the algae. So I conducted experiments in aquaculture ponds, um, working with aquaculture farmers and, and discussing with them like what are the problems that they're facing in the field and also, I was a, I, I conducted a lab experiment looking at um, uh, northeastern ponds and seeing what are the algae dynamics and how do how do they um, react to, to different kinds of treatments. So during this entire process, I learned about the water management field. Um, one very significant thing I learned was that each water system is different. Now you might be thinking that's that's pretty obvious, but I learned about like the nuances. So so. Um, the chemical properties between each water system can be significantly different, even if they're like two miles away from each other, like temperature, pH, conductivity, those can all change how a water system acts. Even the biology of the pond, like what, what fish is in what fish is in there, um, what microorganisms, there can be a completely different community in, in various ponds. Another thing I saw, especially while talking to the aquaculture farmers, was the usage of the pond greatly shifts how we should um, treat this pond, what is like the normal behavior. Um, for example, if it's used for recreation, we have some issues to wor- worry about versus if it's used for drinking water or versus if someone just wants to like put it put it out um, uh, on their front yard, just something nice to look at. And also the environment surrounding the water system greatly affects how this water system acts. And all of these factors relate to how does it how does it affect an algal bloom? For example, the type of algal bloom, the intensity, the effects, um, the duration of the algal bloom, like how long is it affecting the water system? And the extent to the, those effects are, are greatly um, changed by all these factors. So 
that got me thinking about what can a water manager, because, because each water system is super different, what can a water manager do when they have to come up with a way to prevent an algal bloom? Um, and when I was reflecting on this treatment process, I noticed that we were treating reactively. So after we saw an algal bloom in the water, it turned bright green, um, there was like dead fish, then we add the treatment. And this becomes, this becomes um, not, not as effective because the algae is already in the water. So I, kind, I wanted to look into more proactive um, solutions. Maybe we could add a treatment that would um, prevent the algal bloom before, or like subdue the effects of the algal bloom before it became too intense. So this led me to my citizen science engineering projects. Um, so what I what you're seeing on the screen is an aquatic robot. So it's it's like a probe that has a certain radius, um, uh, just like across the length of a of a stream or or or, or around this area. So um, it has sensors to measure turbidity, dissolved oxygen, and temperature, and it also has a colorimeter to look at different wavelengths for algae. So all chlorophyll, so to measure total algae, and also the more toxic algae, cyanobacteria, they have a specific pigment that they can they can produce that the colorometer is able to measure. So this data from this um, uh, aquatic robot or probe is sent to an online web, an online like database in the cloud, where here's, and, and this is like the part where I was able to flesh out like the proactive algal treatments. So I created two algorithms. The first one was let's predict the risk of an algal boom. Now this is based off of the research I had done in the past and a lot of data I'd collected off of um, the internet. EPA has, has a lot of data. The, the store at site has a lot of data. So using those like uh, variables, I was able to create a function to predict based off of slope, um, if there is high risk, low risk or no risk for an algal bloom. And then I created another algorithm to say like, based off of the risk of that algal bloom, what kind of treatment could we apply and when could we apply it such that the, the most negative um, effects in the stream are subdued before it becomes super, like super saturated with algae. So after testing it um, in, in a couple, in a couple like I tested it in Alabama in some aquaculture ponds, um, a couple ponds near Pennsylvania, um, and I'm actually working with, I worked with a landscaping business to test it in their, in their pond th this summer. Um, and I'm working with a farmer in, in Arkansas to test it in their aquaculture pond, ponds. And you can feel free to visit like this entire process on the website equality equality.tech. Um, but I kind of want to transition from, from there into saying like, how am I taking this product or everything I'm learning in the environment through my research, my, my engineering projects, and how do I learn about these issues? And how do I let people know about what I'm doing? So science communication. Um, I first started doing science communication in like 2020. Um, I created a nonprofit for a green environment. At the time, I don't think I really knew what it was, but I think I, I just wanted a way to um, express my ideas through different kinds of media, YouTube, my blog, even a hackathon in order to um, help people understand what I saw as the multiple facets of environmental studies. Um, and one of the examples of that is my podcast, Women in Environmental Science. Actually, the, the basis of this was for me to understand more about like what environmental issues are not really focused on in, in the media uh, and in newspaper outlets and work. And, and, and I wanted to go directly to the source. So um, a bunch of uh, si environmental science researchers. I was also at that time, like I started the podcast, I was struggling to see where could I fit into environmental science. Um, especially as, as an Indian as an Indian woman. So I was thinking like, um, how can I showcase like more diversity in STEM while also learning about the subject? And that kind of was the basis of my podcast. Um, and from there, I've not only learned, not only have I learned a lot about it, about environmental science and what kinds of issues are present, but also I've connected with around uh, 13,000 uh, listeners from over a hundred countries. So I'm really excited about how this, how far this podcast and learning experience has come for me. Now, based off of this podcast, I really wanted to detail like the cycle of environmental science or just science research in general, like coming up with a problem, conducting research on it, um, creating like engineering a solution and then giving it back to the community. And that, that cycle of um, finding environmental solutions. So I put together a couple of my interviews with, with female leaders into creating my book, uh, Gateway to Environmental Solutions. 
Um, and from there, I've been I've been really grateful to to be able to like present at different different panels. Um, and and I'm I I think that with environmental science, it's important that we consider all the like um, aspects of it. Um, for example, it's not just about the science. It's not just about the um, engineering to solve the problem. It's it's mostly honestly about like community involvement. And we've talked a lot about that in the previous presentations today. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say like, like, it's like, thank you. Thank you for listening. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. That's awesome, Saranya. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, we are at 3.36. Uh, let's take maybe just one or two questions for Saranya and then move on to Toby. And hopefully we have some more time at the end to uh, address any other questions. Any immediate questions for Saranya? Saranya, you mentioned a site where one could learn more about the one of your projects. Can you put that in the chat, maybe, the site? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> Bert says, very interesting study. Well done. Thank you. Um, I just dropped that link in the chat. Okay, good. I see it, Saranya. Uh, um, uh, thank you. It was brilliant. It just connects one thing the problem to a way of looking at the solution, communicating. It's uh, holistic. It's and and getting the people and expanding to women. Uh, it's just it's brilliant. Thank you. I appreciate it. Of course, this this like process is not as streamlined as I'm presenting it to you today. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's 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 move on to Toby, and then we can return to questions for the group at the end, just to make sure that Toby has plenty of time. Um, Toby, you want to share screen and go for it? Yeah. Was I was I supposed to David? Was I supposed to send you your? Was I supposed to send you a copy of the presentation? I think I must have missed an email or no, something. No, no, no. Because... If you want to just if you want to just share screen. Um, okay. You can just do it that way. I'll, I'll ask for your presentations to put on the website later, but I don't need it now. If you're okay, just sharing screen. Yeah, I can. I can share screen right now. Sure, go ahead. Let me just get zoom into um. I need a second. My zoom's being a little slow here. Take your time. Yeah, um, along those lines, um, Jay, I have your presentation now, but uh, Elizabeth and Saranya, if you wouldn't mind sending me your presentations, feel free to convert them into PDFs. If you don't mind, if I post them on the resources page, if you just want to email those to me. I'd probably convert mine into PDF and send it again, too, because like okay. the formatting got messed up. Okay, yeah, the formatting did get messed up. All right, good. Thank you, Jay. You're welcome. Does can ever can everyone see my screen? I'm not seeing it yet, Toby. Okay, let me just maybe let me just try again. If there's an issue, you can certainly there it comes. There it is, Toby. Can everyone can everyone see it now? Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay, so again, uh, David, thank you very much for having me. Um, I, this is really a great opportunity for me to be able to share this a little more in the scientific community. Uh, just a little bit of background. I think David touched on how I was working with Saucon Creek Watershed Association, but what I've been doing over the past couple of years is really just organizing monitoring within my community. And I've been focused especially on the Saucon Creek Watershed in the Lehigh Valley. That's just going to be an offshoot of the Lehigh River. And I've really been trying to just make sure that water monitoring doesn't remain some very obscure and like seemingly like out of reach scientific thing. And I've really just been working with multiple organizations to make sure that 
the general public is aware of it. And we have managed to get quite a bit of press attention. Uh, I've managed to publish some op-eds as well as have some interviews that I was able to use to share the results of what is actually going on in our community and how individuals can then take action based off of that. So hey, one hey, of the... Toby, let me interrupt. We're having, I don't know if anyone else, but all I'm seeing right now on my screen is a black screen with it. It says loading. Yeah, me too. Okay. Okay. Hold on. It says my screen sharing is it says it's paused, maybe. Oh. Well, I hit resume and nothing happens. That's the problem. Mm. Can you um, unshare and try sharing again? Yeah, I sh I should probably do that. I think it. Are you using a PowerPoint or what? What what program are you using for your? I'm slides? using Google Slides. Yeah, it looked like you had Google Slides. It should work. I think Elizabeth had hers in Google Slides too. But maybe there's Let me try sharing going. again. Okay. I mean, I guess if need be, you can just scroll through the slides without it being in presentation mode. Okay, it says Toby Brown has started screen sharing. I'm not seeing a screen. Huh. Well, maybe mm, can he can he just email it to you real quick or something? Yeah, or, or I could I could just try I could try just going through the slides. Yeah, I mean, um, why don't you just scroll through the slides? That yeah, I mean, that, that that should work fine. I and mean, that'll get the point across. Something something's gone on with the technology. All right. Is, is this working better now? Yeah, you can see your screen. Okay. So one of the big things I have been focused on, especially in water monitoring across the years, is heavy metal chemistry and specifically monitoring concentrations of heavy metals across Stockton Creek's watershed. Um, I began this back initially just as a um, science fair project for my school that was just for uh, Pennsylvania's science fair. And I based it all on a 2011 Lehigh Valley Planning Commission report. This is why I chose to focus on heavy metal concentration specifically, because that report made clear that Saucon Creek watershed was impaired by excessive uh, sediment contents that was caused by runoff. And the issue with sediment is that sediment can act as an easy source of absorption for heavy metals. That sediment, if it acts as an absorbent, will cause those heavy metals to remain firmly grounded in any sort of stream for a long period of time. So initially, I was had just resolved to research Stockton Creek's watershed generally and to determine whether the heavy metal concentrations across the board were optimistic or not. And then ultimately, based off of that, I decided to narrow in my focus on the most uh, problematic areas of Stockton Creek's watershed and determine from there if the extent of land use was in any way correlated with heavy metal concentration specifically, based especially on potential chemical runoffs from industrial sites and even potentially agricultural sites as well. So really this was just looking to see if a correlation in any way did exist. So just a little context of Stockton Creek's watershed, obviously not many, not everyone here is from that area. So Stockton Creek's watershed just includes the mainstream Stockton Creek as well as several notable tributaries. And all of those tributaries pass through a variety of different terrains and landscapes. Uh, notably, East Branch, Stockton Creek does pass through the most industrialized areas. And Silver Creek and Polk Valley Run are really going to pass through more lightly developed areas or even just deciduous forests. And if global heavy metal concentrations in river water have increased since the 1970s, and all four of these heavy metals are certainly prone to point source discharge. My thought was that potentially some of the more um, densely utilized or more urbanized developed areas would have the highest concentrations. But initially in my research, 
for the first phase, my goal with the first round of tests was to just determine how dire the heavy metal situation was. And based on that, I was primarily going off of EPA standards for the concentration of each heavy metal. Now, the relevant heavy metals just based off of their prevalence in this in this particular area, based off of the Planning Commission's report, were mercury, uh, copper, zinc, and lead. Now, the values here that the EPA listed were standards developed back in the 1980s, going up all the way to around 2007, 2008. And all these values here are considered just generally safe guidelines for toxicity. Now, these values do not pertain to every organism by any means. And a lot of times, even if they are objectively over the set uh, guidelines, organisms can still survive depending on what they are. Because of course, the specific values for different organisms are going to be different and very substantially different. But these are still generally good guidelines for any uh, ecosystem just to ensure that it's continued health. And again, invertebrate species tend to be more vulnerable and susceptible to chronic and acute harm at lower levels of concentration. So my material list was mainly based off of a water test kit that I had, that I had basically just stumbled across at first. But then initially I realized that it could be used for more than just drinking water based on a comparison of readings from just drinking water and then specifically from stream water, which did reveal consistency. So using primarily that set of test strips, I was also just using waterproof thermometers and timers as well as necessary transport materials. And my basic procedure did just involve testing at each of the sites. However, in the initial set of research, the sites were more generalized and were not specifically geared towards any one uh, area. Now, within the watershed, of course, it was a pretty specific area to begin with, but just in the first set of rounds, I was basically focused on smaller, on just a wider, or sorry, just a wider array of areas rather than one specific tributary within that watershed. And this was just a pretty basic procedure here that also just has an important note that results will be measured on various scales for each metal. So the increments of potential concentrations for each metal are quite substantially different. And that does reflect the EPA guidelines that do have very, very uh, widely ranging values for acute and chronic toxicity. Now, going into the initial tests, I had hypothesized that if the Saucon Creek watershed is tested for these four heavy metals that sites across the major tributaries, then the concentration of each heavy metal as measured in milligrams per liter would fall within at least the chronically toxic levels owing itself to an increase globally in heavy metal concentrations. And the fact that Saucon Creek and each of its major tributaries do pass through areas that have at least some human activity. Now, looking back on it, this was certainly a pretty generalized hypothesis and I did not necessarily expect it to be proven fully correct. And it certainly was not. But just for the initial set of data, here are the final averages for heavy metal concentrations. And you'll note, especially that Lead was the one that consistently showed up across all uh, the test sites. And that is going to be significant later on as I went into more specialized trials. Zinc did have, of course, some prevalence and copper did show some prevalence, but mercury was really sh in such small numbers or not present at all that it was basically impossible to quantify because it was so close to zero. Now, the water hardness of test sites this was definitely an important control factor, as was measuring for pH and water temperature. For the later trials, the more specialized trials that I conducted, I don't have the I don't have the data tables set into this PowerPoint just for time's sake, but I do have all of that available if anyone is interested. Uh, the water hardness of these test sites here remained pretty much entirely consistent, and that notably did not stay the same when the later trials were conducted. The temperature varied somewhat. And the graphs here, just to provide a more clear picture of these concentrations. Now, the lead concentrations were very consistently in one area that was approaching the chronic toxicity level, but it wasn't quite there. And these are the copper and zinc concentrations, which tended to fluctuate quite a bit more across test sites. Now, going into the follow-up tests, my hypothesis stated that 
for the most concerning tributaries within Saucon Creek's watershed, just based on the initial test, then industrialization and high development of land will be positively correlated with heavy metal toxicity because of the runoff stemming specifically from industrial and domestic products serving as a concerning source of discharge. And this is where I got into the more technical side of things using Model My Watershed. The outline of the focus watershed here mainly revolved around Saucon Creek's East Branch. And what you can see through here is just uh, that that watershed did have still some variation, of course, in land use. And that is definitely going to be reflected in final results. But within the context of Saucon Creek's watershed, because the the um, darkened red area off to the left of the border there is not part of Saucon Creek's watershed that's going more into the Allentown area. And that's very close to the Lehigh River just in general. That red area there is going to be the most significant within Saucon Creek's watershed. But at the same time, there definitely are some much more underdeveloped areas out towards the east. And that is definitely going to reflect. You can see here this graph here that just delineates all the overall land uses across the board for the east branch of Saucon Creek. Again, deciduous forest is by, far, is by far the highest percentage, but there are also substantial amounts of medium intensity and even high intensity developments there. And that was definitely where I was focused quite a bit in my testing. And I was really just trying to make sure to cover all of the major players here in land use. So obviously open land should be credited. There's just completely undeveloped as well as just deciduous forests. And then I did make sure to pick select sites based on areas that were developed to a lower extent and then ones that were developed to a medium or even higher extent. And this was something a little interesting just on the side, which was back quite a bit before I began this round as part of just a more general water monitoring campaign that I was organizing through a couple of organizations. These are some preliminary warm water tests because the first set of tests were notably performed during winter. And the later tests were not performed during winter. They were performed during the spring and into summer. Now, this is pretty interesting, and this is going to definitely reappear in the results for the later trials, which you can see here, mercury and zinc. Mercury was already not present, but zinc and copper seemed to drop very substantially. And that was certainly a positive, and I took that as a positive when... I was trying to get this out to the public through the press. And I definitely noted that as a community, we are clearly doing something right. Or on the other hand, we might not be doing anything right. And these could be in fact, sorbing to sediment and that could be all that's happening here. But in the end, the only heavy metal that ended up making a reappearance during the later tests and the, no, the water levels were notably lower. So it is certainly possible that evaporation or absorption to sediment, which would of course be a negative, could have been responsible for that change. What you see here is pretty clear that the highest areas with the highest lead concentrations, as lead was the only heavy metal that still had a significant presence, and even that had decreased quite a bit. The areas that had the highest presence of lead were the most heavily developed generally. One notable thing here is that as you moved up from deciduous forests to open space developments, the concentration of lead did increase a little bit. And that is certainly notable because you would think that the drop then from open space development back down to lightly developed and even substantially developed areas could be a sign of weakness in the data. But note that agricultural runoffs are particularly prevalent here and especially in spreading these heavy metals specifically. And open space developments are of course the ones that are most prone to agricultural land use. So that could certainly be an explanation there and that could be why that value there for open space development is a bit higher than the others. And then heavy, heavily developed lands did in fact show the highest concentration of lead. So right here, there's a pretty clear uh, positive correlation between the lead concentration and the extent of human land use. Now, of course, for all the other heavy metals that were not present in the second trial, quite possibly due to sorption to sediment or quite possibly just due to lower water levels and evaporation removing some of them, there is definitely a clear uh, positive correlation factor here. And the line of best fit for the lead concentration versus the extent of land use, the equations over there 
does certainly have a positive slope. Now, it's not particularly significant because obviously for both lightly developed and substantially developed land sites, there is in fact no difference in lead concentration. And that was certainly notable because it revealed that my initial thought that this would just be universally true was not necessarily correct and that the positive correlation I expected was not as strong as I first believed it would be, which is certainly not immediately a bad thing. That could certainly mean that we're just doing a good job. But at the same time, it could mean that there is just going to be more of these heavy metals uh, absorbing to the sediment, and that would not necessarily be a good thing. But overall, based on both trials, uh, the initial and follow-up hypotheses were partially correct. And in the first trial, the average concentration values obtained for two heavy metals were above the EPA's just objective universal values for chronic and acute toxicity. Now, again, this does not necessarily mean that all organisms are going to be impeded, and it certainly doesn't because, after all, you do have quite a bit of activity in Saucon Creek, and you it's, of course, a very well-known fishing site, so it's not it's certainly not going to be universally true. But follow-up trials did also reveal a positive correlation between the extent of land use and heavy metal concentration, specifically lead. However, this was not universally true. And of course, the results demonstrate the need for greater concern, but the situation might not necessarily be as bad as we had first thought. And again, working into this, there were certainly sources of error. Uh, the most obvious one could just be with reading test strips properly. But another notable one was also that in the first round of trials, uh, pH was actually not measured. I, j I, was, I was just not aware that pH would have the same significance that I was now. I, I don't I honestly couldn't really say why. It's kind of a little silly looking back on it. But again, this the fact that these heavy metal concentrations have decreased uh, could owe itself in to the disparities in the extent of evaporation, but it could also mean that the sediment is indeed uh, absorbing quite a bit of these heavy metals. So again, really the results just serve as a firm reminder about the essence of mindful land use and then Going forward, a lot of the research should certainly have to do with quantifying sedimentation. And quantifying sedimentation and comparing it to that original 2011 report is very, very significant to determine whether these changes in heavy metal concentrations are for better or for worse, because clearly there is a correlation between the extent of land use and the presence of heavy metals in the water. However, this does not necessarily mean that the situation is all bad or all good. It's essentially too early to know without quantifying sediment loads. And in addition to that, investigating the specific species of aquatic life present in the watershed could certainly have an impact on this as well. And it could help to determine whether what's going on is actually going to have a major effect on this particular watershed, or if it's just going to essentially pass over it thanks to the organisms that happen to be present there. And these are just some references I used in the phases of my research. And again, just thank you to everyone for having me, especially thank you for David for first just reaching out to me and contacting me about this work that I've been doing. Uh, do you, anyone has questions, I don't know. I don't know how we're doing on time, but I'm happy to answer them. Great, Toby. Thank you so much. Really interesting work you're doing. Um, yeah, we are, um, Toby, if you want to stop screen share, we can. There we go. Thank you. Um, boy, really wonderful presentations from everyone today. Um, we are at four o'clock. Um, so I am going to um, say thank you to everyone and stop recording and we'll just, um, hang on just in case there's any follow-up questions. Thank you, presenters.